now. Let's welcome the next speaker, Dr. Andrew Edmonds. He is the principal scientist charge of innovation group at Element Six that is looking to exploit the quantum sensing applications of a CVD diamond. He has more than 15 years experience in diamond defect physics and synthesis across academia and industry. The topic of his speech is the generation of nitrogen vacancies and symbols in diamond for use. In magnetic field sensing applications. Let's welcome Dr. Edmonds. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Right. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for allowing me to uh, present uh, to you all today. So what I'm going to be talking about today is some of Element 6's recent work where we've been essentially trying to optimize the chemical vapor deposition or CBD growth process to produce samples for magnetic field sensing. Now, first of all, I'm conscious that some of you might not be aware of who Element 6 are as a company and what we are about. So element six actually dates back all the way to 1946 as part of the De Beers group of companies. So we've actually been operating in this space for 70 years, over 70 years now. And essentially uh, today we employ over 1900 people globally. I and my colleagues in R&D are based in the UK. And element six look to try and use diamond and other material, super materials to uh, deliver engineering solutions across a wide range of applications. So we can broadly separate these applications into two different categories. First of all, we have the abrasives applications, so where we're using the diamond's uh, hardness for cutting and machining applications. And typically in that case, we'll be using diamond that we've grown by the high pressure, high temperature HPHT method. Secondly, we have what we call the technological applications where we'll be producing diamond by the chemical vapor deposition. And there's another number of interesting application areas that we focus on here. Traditionally, one of the major areas has been optical, where we're exploiting the fact that diamond has a broad transmission window that extends from the UV all the way to the far infrared. So in this case, we combine this with the fact that diamond is a really good conductor of heat. It has a high thermal conductivity to produce uh, diamond windows that are used in modern high power infrared lasers used for machining. However, given the title of my talk today, it shouldn't be a surprise that I am today concentrating on the quantum sensing applications of diamond. So it shouldn't come as a surprise to any of you that we're looking to use the nitrogen vacancy center. Now I don't need to spend too long discussing all the physics of the MV center. However, there's a few key points that I want to emphasize. Firstly, we know that we can spin polarize this spin one defect uh, simply by optical pumping. And we do this using a green laser or LED. We can then read out what spin state we are in simply by measuring the amount of luminescence uh, that's given off in the red by the MV centers. We then can optically read out that spin state, as I say. Uh, so essentially we have an all optical way of initializing and reading out uh, that spin state. And then finally, we can coherently control the spin state with the application of microwaves. Now critically, this, and if you like, the magic of the MV center is all of this can be done at room temperature because of the high uh, Dubai temperature. And given what I'm talking about today, the other very relevant property is the fact that we have the means to read out the magnitude of a magnetic field incident on an ensemble of centers uh, using the electronic uh, Zeeman interaction by measuring, as I show on the right hand side here, the separation in resonance lines as the magnetic field increases. So I'd briefly like to uh, describe some recent developments that have motivated the work that I'm presenting today and also give you an idea of how we uh, collaborate with other companies. 
So another number of years ago, Lockheed Martin identified Diamond as a potentially disruptive technology for magnetic field sensing. At the same time, Element 6 as a company have a track record of innovation uh, in Diamond for quantum applications, having worked with academic collaborators in this space uh, since 2007. So we kicked off a collaboration between Lockheed Martin and Element 6 uh, back in uh, 2014. Now this sort of collaboration is ideal for us because at Element 6, our expertise is on the diamond material development and ultimately the processing and treatment of that material to generate an engineered uh, solution for a customer. Whereas Lockheed Martin or other companies might have much better uh, ex uh, expertise in the system integration and device development end. So really our role in this project has been the engineering of novel CBD diamond materials to integrate into these test modules for a range of magnetic field sensing applications. And to date, the area that Lockheed have been focusing on is in denied GPS navigation. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is really two things. Firstly, focusing on the optimization of CBD diamond that contains high concentrations of nitrogen, ultimately with the aim to maximize the magnetic field sensitivity of these devices. And then secondly, to start investigating some of the scalability of these processes. So if we're looking to generate an ideal uh, diamond material for this application, we have to be concerned with sensitivity uh, of the device. And since we're making the material, we need to focus on the factors uh, from the material itself that can influence sensitivity. So we can do this by looking at this uh, equation, which is used in many places to describe the minimum detectable magnetic field by a, a magnetic field sensor. And we can pick out three terms that are really uh, critical from the material side. Firstly, we've got the number of MV centers. Now, obviously, if, if we're using an ensemble of MVs and we use a higher concentration, that will generate a higher degree of luminescence and we can get a higher sensitivity in that way. Secondly, we have the, the coherence time, which in the DC sensing case, we parameterize with uh, T2 star. Now, we can think about this coherence time in a slightly different way. If we think about the line width, of a ESR spectrum uh, of MV ensembles, a higher coherence time will give us a sharper, uh, narrower line width. So we're more sensitive to small changes in the applied magnetic field. Then we have this term alpha, which is the contrast. Now really there's two things from the material side that we can do to influence this parameter. Firstly, we have to remember that all the beautiful spin physics of MV only works if MV is negatively charged. In general, in a material, we'll actually have a combination of both neutral and negatively charged defects. Now, this is important because these two charge states have distinct but somewhat overlapping emission spectra. So if we have the situation where we've got a lot of neutral MV, we'll start to swamp the signal that we're trying to detect. And then secondly, the other thing that we can do is control, if we want to, the number of orientations of the MV center that are present. Now, MV is a trigonal defect in a, a TD symmetry uh, lattice in the case of diamond. So we have four different alignments that this defect can adopt. Now, element six first showed back in 2012 that by growing on a different orientation of substrate, we can limit, first of all, to two orientations of MV. And then this motivated further very nice work by academic groups that ultimately showed that by growing on 111, you could limit to a single orientation. However, what we're trying to do is generate a vector magnetic field. So we actually, uh, vector magnetic sensor, sorry. So what we want to do is actually have all these orientations. So for that reason, we've concentrated on growth on one zero zero uh, substrates. So really what we need to start thinking about is how we optimize and increase the number of MV sensors that are used uh, in a sensor. There's obviously two approaches for this. Firstly, we can increase the number of MVs by increasing the area of the sensor at a fixed concentration, or we can increase the concentration of MV minus at a fixed volume, or obviously some combination of these two. Now, in terms of increasing the volume, we just need to be aware that increasing the active area might cause problems because we ultimately need to generate a homogeneous RF and magnetic field, a biased magnetic field across uh, the, the sensor that we're using. So really it comes to the question of what, what might we think is the optimum concentration of MV in a generated uh, sample? 
And we can start thinking about this uh, in a simple sense by looking at the dependence of the coherence time with NICE and remembering also the fact that the concentration of carbon-13, which has a nuclear spin, will also influence the coherence time. So first of all, focus on the plot in the top right, where I show the dependence of coherence time with nitrogen for different uh, concentrations of carbon-13. We can then plot this uh, data set in a slightly different way, actually looking at the product of nitrogen and T2 star, because remember, it's this product in the sensitivity term that we're interested in. Now, this product of nitrogen T2 star is a sensible metric because ultimately the amount of NV that we can generate in this material is gonna be limited by the concentration of nitrogen. So what this plot shows is that in the case of an isotopically enriched sample, around 10 to 20 ppb, uh, ppm, sorry, we reach a maximum in this product. So that's gonna be the, the area that I'm focusing on uh, today. So if we look at the chemical vapor deposition uh, growth process, we can start to understand some of the levers that we can uh, pull to influence the diamond material that's growing. So first of all, we have gas phase thermodynamics where we have to be concerned with what gas mixtures we're using and the purity of them. Now, obviously in this case, we're looking to generate PPM concentrations of nitrogen. So we're actually adding nitrogen back in to that growth process deliberately. But at the same time, we need to have control of the purity of the other gases that we're using to ensure that we get consistent doping. Um, furthermore, we need to be concerned with the gas temperature, which we can control by changing the process power that we're delivering into that plasma. Then we have surface kinetics, where our major drivers are the temperature of the growing uh, diamond and the pressure in the plasma. And then finally, we have the substrate itself. Now, in the case of growth of single crystal diamond, we're growing on a, a smaller diamond seed. And in the bottom right of the video, you can see an example of a single crystal growing in one of our growth processes. So we can choose the orientation of that seed. And critically, in terms of strain, we need to control the surface finish and the dislocation content uh, within that substrate. Now, today, I'm really going to be focusing on two challenges that come about when we start to think about using CBD diamond for this particular application. Now, the first of these is consideration of other spins in CBD diamond. So we've already looked at the effect of nitrogen on T2 star and also carbon-13, but in reality, there's other defects that we need to consider. So we can start to think about this by actually looking at an HPHT diamond to begin with. And this is an example of a plate that contains about 100 ppm of nitrogen. And you'll notice it has a characteristic yellow color. Now, this yellow color comes about because of the presence of substitutional nitrogen. In reality, in CBD, if we look at a typical nitrogen doped process, the situation is somewhat different. As we add in more nitrogen, we don't get a yellow color. What we often see is broadband absorption, which manifests itself in the material looking uh, somewhat brown rather than being yellow. So really, when it comes to a CBD growth process, the challenge is to increase the nitrogen concentration whilst controlling these parasitic uh, defects. These can affect the quantum properties because they can be paramagnetic. And one particularly relevant example in CBD is the nitrogen vacancy hydrogen uh, defect. Now, as a rule of thumb in a CBD growth uh, process, for every uh, 300 uh, substitutional atoms, we'll have 30 MVH uh, defects and only one NV defects. So there's two points I want you to take home from, from that statistic. Firstly, NVH is really common in most uh, CBD diamond. And secondly, NV in an as grown sample is at a really low concentration. And that's why we electron irradiate an anneal to convert the bath of nitrogen that's present in such a material uh, to, to NV. Uh, so essentially these defects can be detrimental to our coherence time, but they can also absorb at both the excitation and collection wavelengths. So the laser we're using to excite the luminescence can be absorbed. And then the luminescence that we're trying to detect to measure the magnetic field can also be absorbed. So we need to ensure that we don't have a lot of these parasitic defects. And in terms of this broadband absorption characteristic, multi-vacancy uh, clusters are thought to be a major role. So it's clearly something we need to control. Then the second thing is strain in the material. Now strain is known to impact the off-axis zero field splitting of the MV uh, centers. So in the case of an ensemble, 
inhomogeneous strain will be a source of uh, decoherence, so reducing T2 star. In CVD diamond, it's typical to see dislocations, so structural imperfections. And what I show on the left here is an example of an X-ray topograph image where you can see uh, individual clusters of dislocations nucleating through the grown uh, sample. So the factors at our disposal and things that we can change to control strains are the substrate dislocation content, so dislocation content in the substrate itself, the surface quality in the interface, and then finally the synthesis conditions. So on the right hand side, I show an example of what could go wrong if, if you don't have control of strain. And we're viewing strain in this case um, by a proxy technique of looking at the biofringence. And if we measure the coherence time in different areas of this sample, we can see it varies greatly in a way that is related to the local distribution of strain in that area. And obviously the coherence time is heavily restricted. So for that reason, strain needs to be controlled. So I'm now at a stage where I can start to describe our approach uh, to optimizing CBD growth for this specifically high nitrogen situation. So we've used two main tools to characterize the diamond. First of all, there's UV-Vis absorption spectroscopy and then FTIR. So in the case of UV-Vis absorption spectroscopy, there's actually a wealth of information that we can get from such a spectrum, especially if we start to deconvolve the various components that make up that spectrum. Now, firstly, and most fundamentally, we have to peak at uh, 270 nanometer, which is known to be associated with the neutral charge state of substitutional nitrogen. So if we can accurately fit this peak, we can accurately quantify the amount of uh, neutral substitutional nitrogen. Then we have the 520 uh, nanometer band, which is thought to be related to the neutral charge state of this nitrogen vacancy hydrogen defect. And then furthermore, we have a 360 nanometer peak and a a slow ramp to higher absorption as the wavelength is decreased and these are thought to be uh, from the vacancy clusters that we described uh, before. And in the case of FTIR we can quantify by looking at these two characteristic peaks both the neutral and positive uh, charge state of substitutional nitrogen. So we need to quantify both these charge states to get an idea of the total substitutional nitrogen content in our material. And then once we've electron irradiated and annealed and generated our ensembles of MV, we need to quantify how much MV that we've got. And we do this again by UV-Vis absorption spectroscopy. And if we cool down to 77K using liquid nitrogen, we can quantify both the neutral and the negative charge states by looking at their characteristic zero phonon lines at 575 and 637 nanometers uh, respectively. We can convert these constant these um, zero phonon lines and the integrated intensity under them using known calibration constants. So we can quantify both charge states. So I'm now at a stage where I can start to describe some of the results uh, that we've obtained as part of this study. So first of all, we commenced an exploration of CBD synthesis conditions by first of all, growing relatively thin layers around hundred microns on uh, higher purity CBD substrates. So what we've done by carefully controlling and pulling the various levers that I've described is found conditions that can provide a higher nitrogen in the CVD samples, whilst at the same time actually reducing the amount of parasitic defects that are present. And you can see that quite clearly in the figure in the center of this slide. So actually moving from left to right, we're doubling the concentration of nitrogen, but at the same time we're going from a material that is highly absorbing, has a high concentration of parasitic defects, to a situation where we have a much uh, lower concentration of parasitic uh, defects. So this is a, a favorable situation to be in. So really the take home point is high nitrogen in CBD does not necessarily lead to an increase in these parasitic defects that we were uh, concerned about. So then the next steps for us were to explore these sort of recipes in further details. So first of all, it was a case of quantifying how much NS is in it in these samples and what fraction of that is neutral. Uh, the reason for that is that these vacancy clusters that I've described are thought to act as an acceptor uh, state. So what we would expect to see is a higher concentration of NS plus when we have a higher concentration of parasitic defects. So the second thing that we've done is actually look at the color of these samples in a quantitative fashion and ask the question of how does it relate to this concentration of NS plus. And then finally, we've looked at the reproducibility uh, within a batch in terms of nitrogen concentrations. 
as we've started increasing the growth thickness towards one millimeter uh, to test the robustness of these recipes and allow us to quantify uh, strain most accurately. So I look at three example recipes in more detail. And again, I want to emphasize that we've managed to increase the nitrogen concentration here whilst also increasing this fraction of neutral uh, nitrogen, which we believe reflects a higher quality of CBD uh, material. And that's borne out by this plot on the bottom uh, right hand side of my slide. So here what we've done is look at the lightness of the material. So this is a, a proxy to uh, how good the colour of the material is as a function of the, what we've quantified in terms of the fraction of neutral uh, single substitution nitrogen. We see a really nice relationship. So this confirms that uh, broadband absorption is associated ultimately with a high fraction of NS uh, plus. So if we want to do a robust study where we're varying lots of parameters, essentially we could just concern ourselves with how much nitrogen is in the material and how good the color is. And hopefully that would give us a good material uh, for uh, magnetic field sensing. And that's what I'll look at in further detail in a moment. But since our target that I described at the beginning of the talk was around 10 uh, to 20 uh, ppm of nitrogen, I've actually now focused on recipe two, which contained around 16 ppm of total nitrogen uh, in the substitutional state, uh, and again, have this very favorable uh, fraction in terms of neutral nitrogen to total substitutional nitrogen. So the first thing we did is look at a, a fraction of a batch of samples that we've uh, produced and assess the consistency in terms of the concentration of nitrogen prior to then irradiating and annealing this material. So in this case, we've looked at uh, 12 samples and we've measured an average uh, concentration in the neutral charge state of 13.1 with a very small variation in nitrogen concentration across uh, those samples. So it appears to be reproducible. So we have good control of substitution nitrogen across a batch of samples. So then we have to ask ourselves what control we have of the vacancy uh, concentration that we're generating by irradiation, since this is important ultimately to ensure a consistent concentration in MV centers. So to do that, we first of all mapped out the yield of vacancies in diamond with uh, varying electron irradiation doses. Now for this, we've actually electron irradiated higher uh, purity uh, diamond and mapped out the concentration of GR1, which is the neutral vacancy as a function of the irradiation dose. And at the same time, we've also mapped out the variation in dose across the area that we're irradiating because ultimately we want to be able to irradiate a large number of samples uh, simultaneously. And then finally, what we've done is looked at the uh, control of the irradiation process over a number of different irradiation runs over a period of time, uh, just over uh, 12 months in this case. And we saw that the vacancy dose varied by less than 4% between these runs. So the take home message here is that we have a small variation in the vacancy dose which we'd expect to give us control of the MV concentration. And then what we saw on the previous slide was a small uh, variation in the substitutional nitrogen uh, concentration, which should give us control of the charge state that NV is present in, remembering that we want the negative charge state. So now what I've done is look at a, a batch of uh, 23 uh, samples that we've uh, produced after electron irradiation and quantified both negative and neutral charge states of MV centers by the UV-Vis absorption spectroscopy technique that I described earlier. And again, the reproducibility looks very favorable. We see a less than 4% variation between uh, the samples. And critically, the majority of MV centers are found in the negative charge state. So we would expect this to manifest itself in a good contrast um, when it comes to integrating this material into a device. So, the combined material radiation and annealing strategies that we've developed give us the means to have controlled MV concentration and charge balance across a batch uh, of material. And I'll show you an example of what this material looks like, because I think it looks uh, quite attractive. We get a very nice uh, purple color that comes about because of our control of parasitic uh, defects and the fact that we have these very high concentrations of MV ensembles uh, in this material. And these samples are uh, one millimeter uh, thick and around three by three millimeters in lateral size. Then back onto strain, which we've identified as being critical. So for this, uh, to begin with, we've looked at uh, biofringence, and this is uh, four representative examples where we see biofringence of 
in this case, a batch of uh, samples that are around 650 microns in thickness. We see average bioinfringence uh, levels down in the 10 to minus uh, five or 10 to the minus six, which is good because this is the bioinfringence level that typically we aim for in our low bioinfringence single crystal uh, products for optical applications. And then as an even better measure, our collaborators at Harvard University have recently looked at material like this and actually measured an image directly the strain experienced by the NV centers uh, themselves. So here you see a strain uh, map uh, generated in that way. And here is the distribution in strain shifts of the NV centers uh, seen in this map. And critically, the, the distribution of the strain is much, much less in terms of full width half maximum than 100 kilohertz, which means we would expect strain to be in no way limiting the coherence time that we would measure in this material. So clearly, the developed synthesis methodologies um, demonstrate low and controlled uh, strain levels. So then again, Harvard University have helped us out with the measurement of T2 star, which we've done, they've done by Ramsey uh, measurements. So to begin with, we started off looking at a sample with natural abundance of carbon-13, and we measured around 400 nanoseconds. Now, what this number enabled us to do was, would be, uh, was to predict what coherence time we would expect to measure in the case of carbon-13 depletion, so where we're using carbon-12 enriched uh, source gases in our process. And if we assume that only nitrogen and uh, carbon-13 that's left is influencing that, we can predict 1.2 microseconds. Indeed, when we looked at a sample where we uh, depleted carbon-13 to 0.005%, we measured pretty much exactly uh, that value, which demonstrates that parasitic defects and strain are a sufficiently low level that it is merely nitrogen and carbon-13 that's left influencing the coherence time. So ultimately, we've achieved coherence times in excess of one microsecond for material with very high concentrations of MV, with most of that being found in negative charge states. So this is, we believe, a very favorable situation to be in. Then uh, finally, in terms of QCing this type of material, we've looked at the reproducibility of this coherence time across, again, a batch of samples. And we've done this by a slightly simpler technique, just by generating an ESR spectrum for each sample and looking at the line width. And you can see quite clearly that we have uh, nicely resolved hyperfine splittings from nitrogen 14 uh, in this sort of material. By this measurement technique, we measured a full width half maximum of 480 kilohertz with only a around a 30 kilohertz variation between uh, samples. So again, it appears that we have good control of this uh, parameter across a range of uh, samples. I should note that in this particular setup, this measurement is limited by the inhomogeneity from the bias field. So these numbers are slightly different to what would be implied from the, the Ramsey measurement that we looked at on the previous slide. But for, for a metric of sample sample variation, this sort of technique, I believe, is, is perfectly adequate. So ultimately, our combined strain control with the low levels of parasitic defects give us a consistent and low line width, or if you like, high T2 star value, despite the high nitrogen and MV concentrations that we've generated in this material. Now, finally, in the remaining time, I'm going to very briefly describe how we apply some of this learning to the generation of thin layers of this material on top of a high purity substrate. Now, clearly, there's also significant interest in these thinner high nitrogen layers on top of a substrate because of applications such as uh, wide uh, field magnetic uh, imaging. So we've commenced trials of growth of these sort of thin layers of this material at the single micron level of this developed 16 ppm recipe. And so far, we've just been using natural abundance uh, carbon-12. So again, we grow the desired thickness of this uh, material on high purity substrates and irradiate and anneal in the same way as described for the bulk process. And then we've used uh, secondary iron mass spectroscopy to confirm the nitrogen. For now, I'll just focus on two ways that we've characterized the material. Firstly, on the left-hand side, white light interferometry. So we're looking at the smoothness of the as-grown surfaces. And pleasingly, we see an RA of less than a nanometer for a, a layer thickness uh, of around one micron for this sort of material. And again, looking at coherence times, we measure in excess of 400 uh, nanoseconds for these natural abundance samples, which is very much commensurate with what we saw in the bulk case. 
So the initial results for this uh, type of material are very promising. You see good quality surfaces and T2 star values in agreement with the bulk uh, growth processes. So in conclusion, really, I think because meetings like this are taking place um, and what we've heard so far really demonstrate the fact that quantum sensing applications are at a mature level. So it's really critical that the material and the producers of that material are ready to support these developing applications. So hopefully I've demonstrated that we've made good progress towards the development of scale capable recipes delivering this range of nitrogen concentrations in a bulk sample, which has good properties in terms of MV concentration and coherence times. And then finally, we're implementing these learnings towards the synthesis of thin layers of this material in a modality, again, that's compatible with scale synthesis. And the early results that I've presented, I believe, look promising. Finally, I'd just like to highlight the fact that this work has recently been written up uh, by a paper uh, between me, other workers at Element 6, and our collaborators at Harvard and Lockheed Martin. So for further details on this work, uh, please check uh, this uh, paper that's currently on the archive. So thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, I'll obviously take questions now, but you're free to contact us if you've got further questions and please uh, follow us on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you.